The man who really killed Jim Crow was Charles Houston, and he did it with the help of another young attorney not long out of law school, Thurgood Marshall. Houston wanted to free children from the blight of racial prejudice. How did he do it? He decided to attack segregation and inequality wherever he found it. Second, he decided to demonstrate through teaching techniques, representations that he made to formal legislative bodies, that the maintenance of separate and equal facilities was too expensive. And third, through legal materials and through his litigation strategies, he tried to bring to an end, once and for all, separate but equal treatment for Americans. These cases slowly but steadily helped develop a body of law that finally led to the Supreme Court decision. In Topeka, the Brown Challenge actually started with McKinley Burnett, the local NAACP chairman, who attempted to get school officials to voluntarily choose to integrate. The schools refused, and at that point, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People decided to institute a legal challenge. The NAACP developed a strategy to promote educational equality in Topeka and set into motion similar strategies in Virginia, South Carolina, Delaware, and the District of Columbia. They would ask African American parents to attempt to enroll their children in their neighborhood schools, which were segregated. If the black children were refused admission, the NAACP would initiate legal action. Just before the fall term in late summer 1950, 13 Topeka parents took their children to the segregated schools and applied for enrollment. All were refused. At the same time in Virginia, African American teenagers boycotted their segregated school to protest conditions. The NAACP also took up their cause and it became one of the five cases later known as Brown versus the Board of Education. All the parents who took their children to school that pivotal day were mothers, with one exception. Oliver L. Brown was the only father in the group. He took his daughter Linda to Sumner School for enrollment. The thing that really sticks in my mind about that day is going to the school, uh, Sumner School, the segregated school that was in our neighborhood, and trying to be enrolled. Uh, when my father told me that's what we were going to do that day. I got very excited thinking about these playmates that I played with all the time. The uh, Hispanic playmates, the uh, Native American playmates, and the Caucasian playmates that I played with every day. Thinking about being able to go to school with them was very, very exciting to me. The amazing thing was I really didn't understand why I couldn't go to school with these playmates. We played together every day, uh, summer, fall, winter, spring, we played together. And when school would start in the fall of the year, then I would go to one school and they would go to the school that was nearest uh, our neighborhood. They would question me and ask me, well, why don't you go to school with us? And I would say, I don't know. And then I would uh, usually go home and talk to my mother about this. And of course, she would try to explain to me it was because of the color of my skin, but being five and six years old, you don't comprehend color of skin. All I know is that I wanted to p go to school with Mona and Guinevere and Wanda that I played with every day. Being a young child, I felt uh, let down because it didn't happen. And I remember on our return walk home from that school, my dad took me by the hand and I could feel tension generating from his hand to mine as we walked along. And I knew something was wrong. Uh, upon returning home, mother and my father talked to me about what had happened and explained that I wasn't going to be able to go to school with uh, Wanda and Guinevere and Mona. And it was because of the color of my skin. It was because I was a Negro and uh, I wouldn't be able to attend that school. I would still have to go to the school that was uh, two and a half miles across town, the all black school. No one is certain why the most important civil rights case in U.S. history came to be named after Oliver L. Brown. 
perhaps because he was a man. It was 1950. Regardless of whose name is used in the legal document, every parent who attempted to enroll his or her black child in a white school on that day exhibited a degree of courage and sacrifice that is difficult for us to understand today. Yet we all continue to benefit from the bravery and perseverance that led to the Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision. The Brown decision provoked a time of difficult transition from segregation to equal educational opportunity. It was never easy. While things were peaceful in Topeka, it was not so in many other parts of the country. Schools were closed for a year in Little Rock, and in Prince Edward County, Virginia, public officials closed the schools for four years rather than allowing African-American children to attend them. When a population is enslaved, Education is denied by those in control. The right to pursue your own education is guaranteed to all children in America today. A bloody civil war was fought to gain that and other rights. Then in 1896, these freedoms were suddenly withdrawn and it took more than half a century until in 1954, we began to get them back. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. We're free at last. <laughs> Martin Luther King said it well. Yet individual freedom so difficult to win, so costly over the years, can be lost in a heartbeat. The right of a child to go to the same school as other children, it's, it's a precious thing. Learn from those who battled overwhelming odds for that right and bear responsibility as a guardian of that right for yourself and your loved ones.